And of course, you guys are sitting in the back and those of you all the way over there, where you think I'm gonna bite you, I know I have a bad reputation. That's why I wore white today. I'm one of the good guys, but I have my black jacket on because I'm a little bit of a badass. So I want you to realize that. And, and I am renowned for in an adult group, just I do some adult words, just like I just did. And I'm less filtered because of, it's already near the end of the conference, you know, in the end of the day. But my name is Karen Kangas. I'm an occupational therapist. And I want to tell you, I've been involved in seating and mobility longer than some of you are, are, have been on earth. Um, and I'm happy and still learning. And I was very involved. I've been involved with this um, conference since its beginning. And let's just say it's really changed. We used to meet on college campuses on the weekends. The students were gone. So, you know, things have really changed. Today, I'm challenged myself with trying to help you have an opportunity to better understand what is becoming now a larger population of who we serve in pediatrics that is very frequently misunderstood, but offers the hugest challenges for seating and mobility. So doing this in one hour is so unbelievably incredible. Only could you know that I would have the balls to try it. And I am going to, all right? Uh, and I'm doing it for the purpose of truly being an advocate for the children that I serve. And, um, and so rather than going on and on even about myself, I just want to tell you, I still am very actively engaged. And those of you who are hoping I would retire, good luck with that. You know, uh, you're going to be dragging me off to my grave. I have spent too many years doing this to learn it and the hard work to then think that it's a time for me to go away and work at a florist shop. So um, uh, without any further ado, I want to talk a little bit about um, dystonia itself. And uh, I want to say that, you know, so many of us in terms of uh, really becoming better clinicians and helping people's lives and trying to match equipment that really works for the individual and not a before and after picture. You know, I am totally not interested in seating that you show me a kid is falling out of and then you show me a still shot that they're even in symmetrical because that position has nothing to do with life. That position of symmetry is critically important only for being fed and for being safe, being getting to school or being on a bus or being in a van. But what happens is when we need to be functional human beings and we need power to do things, too often people see tone and see a medical diagnosis and prognosis as a presumption that that will not change. And I'm here to tell you, we absolutely cannot with seating cure anything. We absolutely with seating honestly cannot prevent much, but we, we, we can with seating make things much worse. And what I'm very concerned about is, is that we still play a lot of games of that I'm doing this because it will make you better, but there is very little evidence that that is true. Because still this, the, the, the whole thing of seating that we're involved in was, came out of really serving paras and quads who have no sensation. And I'm working with not only children who are growing and changing, but who have sensation. And then when we want to talk about dystonia and dystonic cerebral palsy, you know, dystonia can accompany many diseases. Dystonia can be a side effect of medications. Um, and where the dystonia comes from is from the basal ganglia. So there's a non-progressive lesion in the dystonic kids I'm going to be talking about today. Some of them are purely dystonic and, and uh, some of them are dystonic cerebral palsy. And in, in the United States, we don't tend to do that at differential diagnosis that you guys can even figure out. So I wanna talk about a lot of their characteristics. No one person has all of these characteristics, but I want you to understand some things that are very important. Spasticity happens because of a non-progressive lesion in the motor cortex. Apoptosis happens with a non-progressive lesion in the cerebellum, but dystonia comes from a non-progressive lesion in the basal ganglia, which has a very strong connection with the lower brainstem. And this is what makes it so incredibly unique because the lower brainstem is a foundation of all of our most primary systems, which happen to include our motor systems. The most common 
diagnosis, medical diagnosis that we recognize that also is associated with the same area of the brain is Parkinsonism. And the things that we most allude to, we understand about motor issues with Parkinsonism is an intention tremor is a, or a resting tremor, uh, an inability to stop when walking, a stiffness to the gait, uh, a tremor that may uh, appeal the gait, an inability to stop once started. And I'm going to, all kids with dystonia and dyskinesia have parts of that. In addition, what happens with their tone that's so different from athetosis or spasticity is that they have surges of power. And so their tone is demonstrated in surges, not in rest. In rest, many of these kids, especially when they're younger, and I'm going to show you some things to demonstrate that. This is a group of kids that once born, they stay within the normal percentile of growth, usually up until the age of four. And Kids with spasticity and athetosis are in the lower third percentile. So already that's there. The other thing is, is these kids may look like or be mislabeled as having low tone early on, just like kids with athetosis are, but around three, four, and five make a difference. What I will tell you is these are the kids who become the hugest challenges as adolescents. And that's because the surges get larger and get bigger. And one of the reasons they do is because we have not provided them with opportunities of weight bearing. And we have definitely not provided them with opportunities of weight bearing in their seats. Because the other thing that happens is, you know, the body always, the, every movement that you make, every autonomic system that exists physiologically in our body is meant to protect us. And that first level of protection is we need to be able to breathe to live. And so what happens is, is that it may not look like when you see a surge of tone that that surge of tone is a protective reaction, but there actually is a beginning of a protective reaction that happens in all infants, in no matter what your age, no matter what's going on, whether you have a disability or not. And the, the reaction is called an apostotic reaction. And it is, I find that it is demonstrated in dramatically, probably 95% of the time in dystonic CP. Uh, what it is, is many of you know about a startle reaction. Now, a startle reaction is not a reaction that actually goes through the central nervous system. It's something that just goes through the spinal cord. But it is activated by something in the central nervous system, not just through the spinal cord. A startle reaction is when the body is at rest and there is an unknown sound, touch, smell, or anything of sensation, you will get a shot of adrenaline and a shot of extensor tone. Now, I'm making it simple because it's a little more complicated chemically than that, but you all understand those words, so I'm being simple about this. Um, and so that startle is to kick you into figuring out what happened because something is dangerous. Because when we began life at, on the species on this planet Earth, we were nomadic and we had to find places to sleep. And sleep was a dangerous time. There were true predators, not the ones on the internet, not the ones trying to get our money. They were, wanted us actually for a meal. And so what happened is, is when something happened, we needed to move into that startle reaction. So when you see many, many kids, what stops that startle reaction is your movement into weight bearing, which you're moving then from resting all the sensory processing that happens when you're resting to all the sensory processing that exists for you when you have a relationship with gravity, which is only can gravity give you power to your intentional movement. Okay, so what happens is, is opisthotonus is a little bit higher level than the startle. And so what happens is opisthotonus helps us to find our ATNR, our asymmetrical tonic neck reaction, which is the foundation of eye hand coordination, and then moves us once again to finding gravity to then be able to hold ourselves in a position of seeing with visual focus. Okay, so if you go home and look up opisotinus in your medical dictionary or Wikipedia, or you even try and go to a medical library, it's going to tell you that it is a matter of, of static or uncontrolled movement that causes a bridging in the body. And that's because people haven't understood the patterns that are going on. What I want to tell you is I gave two different papers over the last 15 years on both of these topics here. I updated those, and those are in the uploaded handouts for you guys to have. 
All right, so that I'm not gonna go longer into that because I, I wanna immediately start showing you kids. So what happens is between opisthotonus, opisthotonus is set off though as something a little bit more complicated than the startle. And that is inadvertent touch to the occiput, scapula, or sacrum. Inadvertent touch to the occiput, scapula, or sacrum will cause an, a shot of adrenaline and a shot of extensor tone. That will cause so much extensor tone that there will be a bridging that will then move into an ATNR. And if the ATNR can then be expressed, will come back to rest. And actually, when you start meeting dystonic uh, adolescents and adults, it is not understanding what opisthotonus is, but opisthotonus, when it hits an obstacle, becomes, and it can't move through the ATNR back to center, and because you prevented it, it then becomes, then a, there, there develops a huge stuckness, which we clinically call an obligatory response. And we then see people that we feel are stuck in an ATNR when they're older, and we don't know that it was our very seating that has helped them get stuck. Because what happens is, is that when there are surges of tone in the body, which these are involuntary, and they are still protective in nature. And so much of the time, we still think that we are, what's everything that's happening to us or to the people we serve is pathological, somehow secretly abnormal, somehow secretly inhuman, and something is fixable. Instead of understanding that generally when we're talking about sensate bodies that do have a non-progressive lesion, which by the way, we all have non-progressive lesions in different parts of our brain, uh, but that are massive enough to demonstrate a tone problem, Inevitably, we've not understood that their movements are simply dramatic and they may, and those, that drama may occur more frequently than not, and it may be a bigger movement than not, but no movement do they have that is not a human movement that we will not see demonstrated in others. And in dystonia, when there are surges of tone, we have a series of sequential patterns. And those are, really require some important observation on your part. They are usually three to five patterns. And when they are in an individual, they are always the same. And these also, the, this surge when it starts to occur can be ended or reduced with weight bearing, just like the startle can. The startle reflex will end or be reduced by weight bearing. And what I want to tell you is weight bearing occurs not by the things that you are talking. We often talk about everybody thinks they understand weight bearing, but weight bearing is actually gravity itself, that electromagnetic field that is in planet Earth speaking to our center of gravity, which is right in front of sacral level two, while we are moving. So we have to move to find gravity and we need gravity to help us move with power. So we have movement without gravity, but it is not powerful. There's no strength to it. Um, so what happens is, is that the way we receive that is that early on as a baby, of course, in prone, their center of gravity is right down on the ground or it is on your body. They are use your body as if it were the floor and that little head pops up in a head writing reaction. And that head writing can occur because the pelvis is getting the information from gravity. And then we have kids sit on the floor and crawl around on the floor. And again, their center of gravity is close to real gravity and they understand what's going on. When you lay down, however, and your whole body is down, it doesn't feel gravity because you're at rest. This is the interesting thing. The more the body comes in contact with the surface, the more it gives into that surface. So that's why we have lazy boy chairs. Okay, because we want to be lazy. The, the more our body touches, the more we don't do. We don't say I have a very important document to write, so I'm headed over to the lazy boy. You know, we, and so what happens is, is that we need rest and we need movement, but we aren't understanding how much we depend on the power of gravity. And gravity, as we get older, goes through our lower extremities to talk to our pelvis. But the pelvis is the ruler of all extremities. It, your head is not controlled by the shoulder girdle. Your head is controlled by the pelvis. And the girdles do control the extremities, but their power and their ability to help you manage your body only comes from weight bearing. So if I tell you that weight bearing speaks to you most frequently by your feet being on the floor, and I then tell you that it also speaks to you through movement, I want you to tell me when you are working with the most challenging kids with tone, how much of the day are their feet on the floor? How much of the day have you freed them up to actually have experience of movement? And I'm here to tell you very little. So the biggest problem that happens for people who have tone is their inexperience with gravity. 
So they start to grow. And it is, in my opinion, and this is one thing where I know people think I'm crazy, but it's all right. I don't mind that you do. I will have a long discussion with you over an adult beverage at any time. Uh, uh, but what I want to say is, is that these are the kids who also more frequently develop scoliosis. These are definitely, they definitely have rotated pelvis. Definitely the girdles are not in sync with each other. And one of the reasons is this incredible lack of experience. So what I was going to tell you, I will tell you that kids with dystonia look like they're getting worse as they get older. What they are doing is they're needing protection more dramatically. And they are hard to handle, okay? So when they're, let me just give you some characteristics though, in terms of dystonia and particularly how it relates and, and then dyskinesia as well, because they can go together. Okay, so, um, all right, I have talked about that. Um, the other thing is that is important is that when you strap somebody in, and by the way, these guys do need judicious strapping, they will even prefer it because they know their body can get wild. And so, uh, but it, there, if you also look in medical dictionaries or in medical articles, they'll talk about flailing. Like flailing is something, I don't know, like we understand. In my opinion, it is as bad a term as a misogynistic racist remark. Um, because what happens, there are patterns of movement that are easily identifiable if you know what you're looking for. But physicians and generally getting a differential diagnosis for kids like us is not important still to the community because there's not a real treatment process by having a differential diagnosis, but there is a strong one clinically. And that's what I'm holding all of you here to listen to. It's clinically our responsibility is not to wait around for evidence-based practice. Our responsibility as clinicians is to record practice-based evidence, okay? Practice-based evidence is extremely important and that's what I've done. And, and, and none of you could do this like I have now because you haven't lived long enough practice-based evidence, I can show you kid after kid after kid, and I can tell you, even ones that I, was, that I treated when I was younger that I didn't understand, you know, that I now better understand. But the children themselves have been the ones that have helped me, and then a ton of reading. There's, I can't give you 10 articles that help you understand this. The few articles that are written and go around are, are really hard, but I will say to you, when I'm really working with a kid that I have some really important issues to ask, I tell the family, please go to your neurologist and ask if he really, if he, he uh, uh, thinks that your, your kid has, uh, has dystonia. And I, you know what I'll tell you is two of one, they do. And the doctor, but still on their diagnosis is cerebral palsy, spastic quad. And if you don't understand dystonia and you don't understand brain stem issues are the foundation of carrying the knowledge of movement in our entire bodies. So what'll happen is, is when there's a lesion there, that means that the processing isn't happening cleanly. And, and as the body then has an interaction, it, a body just like when you get a cut and you develop more scar tissue and healing because the body's reaction when something hurts it is always to say, I'm gonna help you extra well to make sure that that wound is closed. Well, the same thing happens with tone. If they don't find that you're weight bearing, there's more responsibility then for the body to deal with protective reactions. And so those protective reactions get stronger. Those protective reactions we call primitive. I also find that an offensive term. They are not primitive, they are foundational patterns. So they are, we don't leave any of our foundational patterns. They live with us through our whole lives. What we do is we grow an entire repertoire of increased control. And as we gain control, the control doesn't happen just automatically. There is a developmental sequence to how it grows, but it also is dependent upon our experience. Because when we want to get involved with anything competently, you know, in terms of ambulation, you don't just grow up and are ambulating. Your brain starts to give you the automaticity of ambulation when you use it in regard to intention. So in other words, a child does not say, I just can't wait to walk and the farther I walk, the happier I am. The only thing they care about ambulation is that they want to go see something, touch something, feel it, be near it, which can include you. So what'll happen is, is if they don't get those opportunities and crawling doesn't, isn't good enough, they don't just wanna be on the floor. I mean, one of the reasons we talk about the terrible twos is because two-year-olds really think they could manage a chef knife, you know, and they also do really believe that they could rule the world. They've seen enough of it and they don't want you telling them that they can't, you know, 
Uh, but what I was going to say is what's happening at two is they've discovered they can crawl and walk and pull up onto a couch and pull up the stairs and climb up on a stool. And do you know what they can't do? They can't get down. They have a lot of trouble getting down. Okay, so what's happening is all that climbing and getting up is what helps generate a neuronal pathway in their mind, in their brain, that supports competency that they call upon then when they go in the living room to climb the couch. So if our children get no experience with weight bearing, they don't develop neuronal pathways. The brain then says, I better use my more dramatic and careful protective reactions and offer them to you. I need to give you more tone. And what happens in the biggest tone that we see is we see the extremities responding bilaterally because the girdles are unstable. So when I'm walking around, you know, and I'm walking around up here, I actually am holding my shoulder girdle, actively holding my shoulder girdle so that uh, my pelvic girdle can, can be a primary mover and can make different judgments and do that. If I would not hold my shoulder girdle, I would collapse here. And if I'm collapsing like this, I, I'm going, we're going to watch me immediately catch cerebral palsy. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to drop my, all I'm doing is I'm not holding my shoulder girdle. My arms are not innervated. I am in internal rotation. It causes my trunk to collapse. I've lost my head. I'm propping it on the back. But when I attempt to take a step, I can't lift it up. I can only circumduct. And what do we call that? Scissoring. Okay, which I don't know where we gave her that word either. I've never seen any scissors do that. But at any rate, not understanding that, that's not a CP movement. That's a non innervated pelvis. So when I want to sit, I need to be able to hold my pelvis actively so I can rotate to use my shoulder girdle with power, but not have my pelvis and lower extremities be propped. They have to be holding me. So we need to have those shifts. That comes from gravity speaking to those girdles from my legs, my feet being on the floor. When I am using gravity, it calms all the protective reactions. When I am using gravity, it calms all the protective reactions because I'm saying I have intention. I know what I'm doing. I have control. And that's the part we're totally missing with these guys in terms of trying to help them and help seating figure them out. Uh, I actually, so I want to just describe a few uh, a few things, uh, uh, when, when kids are really little, these are the kids that we often label all or nothing. Uh, and that when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about kids particularly under the age of three. They look like a wet noodle and then they look like an ironing board. Uh, some of them can really sweat a lot. Now, I'm not talking about kids that we know have a hypothalamus problem. No, these kids can sweat a lot. They can be bald at the back of their head and it's not hard to figure that out because they push against their seating system. When they're older, they can break any headrest that you put in. They can break off their leg rests, okay? They can also still sweat and they move into positions that they get stuck in. So these are the kids also, if you get a little bit too close to them and their little hand grabs onto your, uh, onto your jacket, it's starting to come off. And unfortunately, it's usually when you just have a shirt on and they are now exposing you to the world, okay? And, and you are then attempting to calmly release them while, and, and at the same time, cover your boob, because this is the old bra that I didn't want anybody to know I still really wear, okay? And so I really don't care anymore that you'd see me nude, because you could just close your eyes or laugh, you know? I, I, I don't have to worry that I'm enticing you in any way. But what I'm more embarrassed about is that you know that's that old favorite bra that's there that has bleach marks on it and probably a stain or two that I don't even know what it is, but you might imagine it, okay? Um, so, so what will happen is, is you try and release them, they become, it becomes tighter. So what happens is when we're in protective reactions and non-weight bearing, the extremities don't have fluid movements. And so the kids distally, their hands or their feet, when you meet them with resistance, they will meet you back with more resistance. The reason they're breaking it, they don't have so much power. The reason they're breaking off their headrest is not because they have so much power. It's because the pelvis is unstable. The pelvis is not holding them. So they are having an aggressive startle or opisthotic reaction along with a surge. Those two pairing has so power in space 
that they can break things because they've met a resistance. When I'm working with kids with dystonia directly, I take off not their headrests and their leg rests because even if they have a surge, they won't hit an obstacle. It will not become as strong and it will not last as long. Okay. So then, so the, like I said, they also all have different patterns, patterns of movement. And then, and then a lot of people see this obligatory ATNR. That's also not true again. It's a pattern that has happened because we have never let them have freedom at the extremity level along with pelvic weight bearing. Okay, so the most important thing is that we really start to look at what pelvic weight bearing is. Pelvic weight bearing does not occur at 90-90. There is no weight bearing at 90-90. 90-90 is not a physiological pattern. It is made up science that we hand around like we know what we're talking about. And it actually occurred when we invited engineers into the industry and we invited engineers in the industry not to industry in the industry to help us. We actually needed wanted engineers to help us change wheelchairs for where all seating began was post-war young boys who were still alive for amputees. And that those amputations occurred not like a peripheral neuropathy, but in so it's made unpredictable things. Somebody could have half of a pelvis, you know, and uh, and and then have but have both arms, or then one the opposite arm was missing fingers or was missing part of something else. And I want to tell you, we still don't serve those guys well. But when engineers came in and we started looking, they started looking at the chair, and we wanted them to look at the chair in terms of its relationship of us being able to use it. And if you still look at chairs, chairs have not still dramatically changed. But what happened is those engineers, as they might do, started sticking their nose in our other business. And that's okay, I, I, I need equipment. I don't have any problem with engineers, but engineers don't understand the body. They still believe that a skeleton is really two dowel rods with tennis balls attached, okay? They like to see the body as a stick figure. And I'm here to tell you that even if I were a seven foot four NBA player, even my femur would not be a dowel. All of our bones have rotatory forces to them. There is no 90 anywhere. We are all round. And if you don't believe me, then you haven't been looking at my ass as I've been walking around here. Now, I, and that's what I'm trying to tell you. We are rounded, our bones are rounded and they're rounded because they are meant to be able to move to the center to support our ability to do work. And our work is all about our eyes and hands being able to work together. And, and even when we ambulate, we're not supposed to be ambulating out here or throwing legs back or doing like that. It's that we're able to, in a smaller space, more efficiently use our energy to be able to get some place that we need to, and then very quickly hold. And that hold is then not, we don't place our legs exactly together. And in fact, if we do, we will actually release, we'll lock our skeleton and we'll lock our pelvis and we'll actually give in. So even when people are now talking about that they want to stand at the office, if you're standing at the office and working at a computer, I'm guaranteeing you you're gonna get yourself migraines. Because standing at an activity must mean movement, not standing still. Stillness to the body is always detrimental. The only active stillness we do is if you learn to meditate. And it's, not, it's hard, but you can purposely do it and it can bring breath to you. But stillness to the body is not what we're meant to do. And even when we're seated, we're meant, meant to move slightly. But our movement is to be meant uh, based on weight bearing to control our extremities. So weight bearing occurs, for weight bearing to occur, this is a seated position in weight bearing. Knees lower than the pelvis, not in line with the pelvis. At least one leg has to be lower than the pelvis. Otherwise, even all the seats that you're sitting on, you guys are all leaning against the back. And what are you doing as you're leaning against the back? A legs out, the head's over here. I tell everybody, if I could just help train every single kid that I see with cerebral palsy, that when their head started to go, they did this, we would stop having horrible headrests. Because the reason you're doing this is because you gave up your pelvis. You can give up your pelvis here, you can be coming forward, but if you're not weight bearing. So what happens is weight bearing isn't just asymmetrical. The fact is, is what weight bearing is, is that we use rotatory forces to find gravity to speak through part of our body. So just like I said, you hold your shoulder girdle while your pelvis is active. And I'm now, and then when you're seated, you hold your pelvis for your shoulder to be there. Well, you can't hold it unless your legs start to move a little bit. And when they start to move a little bit, the other thing that has to happen is we have to then have some rotation. So you don't just move your leg. Oh, I only move my leg linearly. That's all I can do. We can't have any rotatory forces. No, if you don't have rotation, rotation does not bring power. The girdles are not connected unless there's power. So dyskinesia clinically is the girdles are not relating to each other. 
Dyskinesia means the girdles don't talk to each other. And so what happens is that's particularly when you're dealing with a kid who's dyskinetic and dystonic. That's why you think the head's connected to the shoulders is because the girdles aren't speaking to each other. But the way you help the girdles talk to each other is not by doing 500 million things at the head. It's by starting with the pelvis and building up. But when you're starting with the pelvis and building up, it means the feet have got to be on the floor. And it also means that you cannot be in this active seating position unless you're engaged in an activity of intention. You can't do this on a mat table. Everything that you do on a mat table is someone cooperating with you or collaborating with you. But when the body finds gravity, they, you use it for activity of intention. That activity of intention doesn't mean I have to write. I can look over your shoulder because I'm curious about what you're doing and that can be my intentional activity. Uh, I would like my kids to even be far more involved than that, but that's the part that where we're underestimating stuff. So uh, just like, um, uh, and so one of the reasons that I really, most, many, many, many of you here, if you have been around, have known me for pediatric power, because I was, you know, one of the first big advocates of really, really having very young children in power. And one of the things is, well, I wanted them to have mobility experiences because mobility is so important to get near things, not drive down the middle. I, power chair is not an amusement ride. I don't care about that. I want, a, I want a power chair to be legs. And, and what do you do? And children ambulate to get close to something, near something, touch something, be involved with something. Or by the way, leave. All right. Um, so we, all of our power chairs, there's not a power chair over there that ha is supporting a kid's being able to be engaged in activity. Not a single one exists. They're all too big. They don't get close. Your hands can't get close to anything. They do not help you get close to anything. You can't drive close to the wall. You can't get your feet in anything. And that's why another reason why people think I'm crazy. I take off leg rest when we're engaged in, when we're in familiar environments, because I want the kids' feet to touch the wall. I want the feet, their feet to touch their parents' legs. I want their feet to feel where they are. Now, they're not zooming around. This is how fast their pro chairs programmed. So I know it's frightening. Are you scared yet? I think they might break a leg. Okay, so... Uh, so what's going to happen is, as we start looking at these kids, um, I, want, I want you to understand um, one of the things that I've, I've done uh, is also, oh, also, when we're, we're dealing with non-speaking kids who have tone, if you haven't figured out, when I'm talking about tactile processing uh, and protective reactions, that means the body's hypervigilant. So hypervigilant is what you will be at the end of this conference because you will, should all be very tired, overtired, because you haven't had structured sleeping. You may be constipated because, you know, it's hard to travel on the road. You know, uh, you certainly you didn't, probably didn't eat well. You may have overdrunk, whatever, you know, all those things. But you're very, very tired. And so although you feel like you're slow to respond, if something dangerous happens, if all of a sudden you hear a fire alarm, or if you all of a sudden trip, you have an overreaction to it. And that's hypervigilance. Okay, so hypervigilant grows the longer your body appears to be slowed or relaxed. And that's what happens to our kids. Because the seating that we have them in, we're pushing them around in passive positions all day long. And so because the body is remaining so passive, then when something does happen, they, get, they have a hypervigilant reaction. And that can happen because when you're dealing with someone who's non-speaking, this is what happens is we just approach kids, especially if they've moved out of their seating system. Since we've given them such rigid seating systems that only allow them to move in very particular ways. I like to say anybody who has cerebral palsy, the clinicians and, and uh, suppliers, all of us treat them as if there's a 13th commandment we all must adhere to. And that is no part of thy body shall touch another part of thy body or go wander outside the frame of thy chair or thou shalt be strapped. And so what happens is, is that we have this predetermined, especially for these guys that are hard to handle, if I keep you symmetrical and I keep you midline and I keep all the straps on, you'll be relaxed. But I'm here to tell you, relaxation is not life. And so when you do that, you then approach people that when you wanna change positions to them, we transfer these guys by the one, two, three method, okay? Here I come, you ready to go? One, two, three, doesn't matter if you answer me or not. One, two, three, here I go and I throw you into a standing frame. 
and thinking that in a standing frame that, by the way, was developed for paraplegics because they were dying of urinary tract infections after they calfed themselves because they had so much residual urine. So we developed a standing frame that they had to stand in at least one half an hour a day so that the urine would, would drain to the base of the urethra so that when they calfed themselves, they would get it all or most of it. And we stopped having lethal urinary tract infections. And those are the standing frames we're using for kids with sensation. And I'm here to tell you why they don't work well is because you're non-weight bearing in them. You're symmetrically in them. I've strapped you in, I've strapped you in upright because upright, when the shoulder girdle is directly over the pelvis, I don't hold myself. I lock my skeleton and I allow myself just to be propped. Because for me to stand, I'm going to make weight shifts. That's gonna be weight bearing. We should be using our walkers as dynamic standers. And why would I take a sensate kid and put him in a stander and they still have to be on a foot rest? And here's a clue what the foot is doing. Foot rest, head rest, got it? Not head working, not foot holding, all right? So what I'm saying is we've done things that by the way, I'm not telling you are wrong. Isn't that funny? You've just been spent 20 minutes telling me they're wrong. No, I'm telling you, what did I tell you they were really important for? Management to get on the bus, safe passive transport, safe passive transport, and to be fed. Is feeding pretty important? Feeding's pretty important. What they are is they're not enough. I want every kid I see absolutely to have those systems for those two reasons. Those are big, big, big. Their families have to push them around and they have to be helped and they have to be taken care of but we need other stuff so they can participate better in life. Okay, so one of the things is I also, we, if you've got somebody who's hypervigilant and you approach them, you're gonna then cause a startle on top of an opisthotonic reaction on top of surges of tone. If that includes you managing them distally, that's their hands and feet. So if you touch their hands and feet first, you're gonna cause a surge because that's where the pregnant, you need to handle these guys proximally. So this is the problem. So here we have a person that's strapped in. And by the way, because they go into hyperextension, we have these majorly wedged seats. So their butt is way down, their knees are high. And inevitably what happens is, is when they intend to move, what can they do to move? They start to move their head and when they start, or they start to try and find their pelvis, but the only way the pelvis can move is pop up. And when the pel pel pelvis pops up, it has the head pushed back against the headrest. If the pelvis knew that it was to push down and have a leg support it staying there, the head would never get so powerful to break something. Um, so inevitably, when I see broken things, I know that we have unstable pelvises and unstable shoulder girdles, and the body is reacting in a hypervigilant way. And one of the patterns of movement that's most often demonstrated is the body protects itself. So we see the lower extremities and upper extremities both go into internal rotation and cross to protect our organs. Again, a very natural and human pattern. All right, so I really believe that, that we approach kids, these kids, and also because they don't talk, we have to handle them so much, we, we also approach them constantly unpredictably. And when I tell you that these guys have some of the most normal sensation, I'm gonna tell you at the same time, I think about 25 to 30% of the kids that I see with dystonia would have been athletes. And that's another whole long thing that I'm hoping to write a paper about, meaning I think they would have been gifted, gifted motorically. And, 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 here, and here they are stuck. So what happens is their trust of their hypervigilance, you know, like we call our basketball paper hyperkinesthetic. I mean, like you have eyes in the back of your head, are, they have gifts. So some of these gifted kids motorically now are facing some of the, we've jailed them in. We've truly jailed them in. And, um, and, and, and a, a jail doesn't work for anybody, honestly, for anything, especially for you to have a trapped body. So what'll happen is, is we uh, approach these kids unpredictably. And that unpredictability is then demonstrated by a surge of tone occurring. And also, or we will whisper to people, remember, this is such a hard transfer now, let's just be ready now. Everybody calm down, stay calm. You know, those of us who work with them well, a lot, know the one thing we have to do is very calm, but it's not just a matter of being calm. You can't grab them, PTs, okay. You know, I tell it, you know how I can tell the difference between a PT and OT? A PT will grab anybody's pelvis without even suggesting that they're doing it and they have no qualms about it. 
and OT will ask permission and smile. Okay, so what I want to say is, is that when we approach these kids unpredictably, we aren't recognizing that we're causing their tone. And when we cause a surge in their tone, I told you, then we can, we can also activate from hypervigilance their opistotic reaction. But I want to think, I want you to think about these kids. You know, when kids are in hyperextension and they're hard, we then flex them to get them in a chair because we've been taught, you know, we, you do the opposite. So if you got too much extension, I flex you, you'll relax. Well, that's sort of true, but it's not true if someone has dystonia. Because when you put somebody in a chair in a transfer, when they are flexed, you drop them right on their scapula and sacrum. So guess what they do? They bridge. And so then you even use more power to bend their knees really, really up, almost to their chest, and hold on to their occiput and drop them in. Now they bridge again. So now you call two other people. Somebody get over here so I can get the seatbelt on. And when that seatbelt clicks, the kid and all of you go, oh, thank God. We made it. All right. And to one of you, you are in love with these children because they are real children. I, I'm in love with all real children, but these, these guys, these guys, you know, tremendous there. But if you don't think that they know that that's hard, they're already anxious when you're approaching them. And when you unpredictably do it, they're hypervigilant. So things have to be predictable. So I tell people all the time, the transfer, the one, two, three shouldn't be when you transfer. The one through three is about your approach. So I, don't, I, I say to somebody, not what I'm going to do to you, is I say, I'm coming over. We need to do a transfer because we are going to the standing frame or we are going to lunch or we are going to get changed or what, whatever it is you're going to do. And say, I am, and I am not going to, I'm only going to approach an arm's length of you. So I'm, I'm coming up beside your chair. On the count of three, I'm going to move close to your chair. One, two, three, I'm now there. I'm now gonna place my hand behind your shoulder. One, two, three. You will feel it there. My hand is gonna stay there while I come down on your knee. One, two, three. I then I'm gonna reach under your knee. One, two, three. And what I will tell you is if you start this one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three is a rhythm that exists in all cultures. Okay, and I, I know we have an eight count for dancing, but that one, two, three, we, tons of stories about one, two, three, and songs that we sing all the time. One, two, three is calming. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So if you stretch out, you'd use the one, two, three, that body will remain calm and can be able to hold itself while you then go to lift it up. But when you just say, I'm coming over, that's not enough. Well, or you can't be long winded, which you might think I would be. I, it is true. I can make any short story long, but I was going to say you, you instead, you, when I'm with these kids, no. Um, and these are kids whose arms fly up when you try and go through a doorway. These because, and their startle is overactive. Again, weight bearing. They are kids who have so many straps on that then when they've grabbed your shirt, how do you reach them? proximally to get them weight bearing when they're already trapped in, under all these straps and everything. So I did develop a barrier vest, which is a lightweight trunk orthotic that covers the scapula and sacrum so that when I'm working with you in activity, I can handle your sacrum and scapula and I don't have to, and the head, I'm allowed to stay away from that occiput. So, all right, let's kind of try and figure out by observing, trying to figure out what some of these patterns are that we're gonna see. Oh my God, see what I mean? I have 15 minutes. Holy, you know what? I promised I wouldn't say two words and they are ready to come out. Time flies. Okay. First, I want to show you an opistotic reaction in a, where the heck is my mouse? There it is. Okay. So here's B who's five months old. And this is, this is an opistotic reaction in a, in a five month old. And you'll see those a lot. And you can't really see um, her arm is, Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. There it is, okay. So this arm doesn't look like it's as much in flexion as it could be, and this arm isn't an extension, but you can really see it in the legs. This one headed towards it, uh, extension like an ATNR would, all right? Um, so that's there, and she's able to move through that and then on to, on to the next. All right, so I want you to watch Zach, and I wanna show you a video of him. And a lot of times when I'm working in PowerPoint, um, in with PowerPoint projectors, unfortunately, the um, movies don't play. I want sound here.
now you can turn the sound down. I know that sounds funny, but what I wanted to say is I want to guide you with what's going on. I'm actually working with a team. I'm using a communication device myself, which is why it looks so funny that I have that weird look on my face because I'm not speaking and they didn't know I was not going to speak. He's using a communication device and I'm, a and I'm asking people with my device, why am I meeting Zach today? And they actually ignored me. So Zach is answering the question. And that clicking that you're hearing is him hitting his switch to tell me with his communication device what he wants. And what it turns out, what we actually were going to do, what Zach, what we were going to do is we were going to have his drive controller manage his communication device. Okay, but so I wanted you just to hear that clicking because I wanted you to know how with it he is. I'm going to bring you back to the beginning, though, and I want you to watch his extremities. Okay, so I want you to watch. Here is this hand. So you see it in external, overly externally rotated and flexed and hand flexed. But I want you to look at this hand. Can you see it? I know it's hard to see, but look carefully right there. See the hands going, fingers going like this. They're holding the edge of his tray and going like this, just as if I would do. Can you see them right there? And do you see this one? It's starting to do it. Okay. Now what you can't see in his lower extremities is that on this side, this leg is going into more extension and this one's going more into flexion. And that's the beginning of one of his patterns. Now, the reason I wanted to show you that is that is just like a resting tremor or but instead of it being a tremor, it's a resting movement. So you will see kids that have extreme and you'll say, oh my God, look, he isolated all of his fingers. The other side is, oh, got that little fisted see if he can look, you know? Um, but uh, really what we have is, you know, so it, it, he's stabilizing it, that, that hand isn't doing, it. but when he's totally at rest, these fingers all come apart. So people are like, oh, well, look, he can do this. He can't tell him to do that. That just happens to him. Um, so you will see kids with dystonia at rest have some very natural movements, but they are occurring as involuntarily as their surges of tone. This is another one I want, whoops, sorry. I want to show you, Greg. This one I do want sound. And in the beginning, just all be tolerant. You aren't going to understand what's being said, but it'll make sense in just a few moments. So be patient. So sound mic, thanks. Whoops, let's go. Back there, see, I can get your little part. I'm looking too. As soon as I try it, which I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. Are you worried about it? You're worried. We'll not have to do it. It's okay. You don't have to do it. You need to tell something. You need your voice. There's something you want to say, Greg. Greg, you have something you want to say? Let me get you going. section here more in something wrong yes okay you're frustrated and it's not fair mean scary or worried yes okay not fair no mean no scary yes oh, scary okay 
little bit scary. It's a little bit scary. It's okay. Okay, so let me tell you what we can do with that and see if it's a good idea. Okay. So what happened is I was there to do a power mobility eval. What you're seeing with me is I'm holding around the pelvis. I'm not touching his sacrum, his scapula, or the, his occiput. It may, and I'm also doing a little bit of rocking. He's never met me before. He has worked with, obviously, that's his mom, and this is also his teacher, who I work with a lot. Some of you may know, recognize that's Linda Burkhardt. And what's happened is, is they've been working on a communication system, and because he can't always look the same way in his body, so power is, it can act, overreact and, and go into such hyperextension. What the mother actually figured out, and now they use with a lot, uh, it's been used with a lot of kids, is, is Linda is putting her uh, thumb and index finger around his face, and he must touch one or the other for yes or no. And so she then is asking him, they have a quick word list when he is distressed. So a lot of people should recognize that cry. And you know what we normally do with it? It's okay. Did something hurt? Are you okay? We don't actually figure it out. What do you, I actually, in the beginning, was talking to him in a very quiet voice saying that we are, the power chair is right out of view of the camera. The power chair is over there. I'm going to have your mom get in it. I want you to see how it works. I know you, Linda said you're really excited to try. But if you don't want to try it today, you don't have to. But even then, he had to tell us he was scared. Would that be abnormal of any five-year-old? No. Five-year-olds notoriously are brave and scared the next second. You know, they want to do something, and then when they really think about it, it's not. So I wanted to show you, not only in terms of handling, but I wanted to show you how often these kids may scream or cry, and we somehow think they're in pain because we somehow associate this, these body postures start talking to us as if it's something we cannot comprehend or understand. So I next want to show you Tyler, and I want to, I do not need sound with this one. And what I want to show you is I was, Tyler here is three years old. And so I want you to see the size of him is really like a three-year-old. He is in the 70th percentile for being three years old, which is perfectly fine. Um, and I was told he had no head control. He does have little glasses that they are suspecting. He also has some cortical visual processing problems. Uh, they, he can't sit up. You know, this is the kind of chair that they're using. And uh, so same thing is, so I'm going to be doing an a, assessment with him. So first I'm telling him, I'm just going to take him out of the chair. I have no idea whether he has dystonia or not. This I see him just like that, but I do see a collapsed trunk. And I will say when I handle kids all of the time, I'm just telling him I'm going to take him out and put him on my lap. And that's his mom and sister next. I'm going to try and pick him up without touching the sacrum, scapula, or occiput. And that's one of the transfer techniques I do. So you have to be careful in terms of doing it. Now, right here, let me just stop. When you see, you're seeing this arm go out, this arm come forward. What you can't feel is I can feel this against my leg. This is tightening. So what happens is this first pattern is this side is going into flexion. This side's going to extension. But this, leg, this arm is literally twisting and going back. This is an absolute sign of dystonia. No other forms of cerebral palsy really do that. This arm purposely gets like it flies back and it can get stuck in the back. So let's uh, see what happens from there. So I've got in him a slightly weight bearing position, meaning head and shoulder girdle in front of the pelvis, but he's not weight bearing. There's nothing on his feet. So I'm asking for people to bring me a little stool. So now when I put him down, you can really see this side flex and this side extend. All right, see it? And then he moves into both upper extremities, move into extension. This one's still back here being stuck. All right, now that leg's coming up. I'm going to move him into weight bearing, just at the pelvis. And I want you to see the reduction in tone. There it went. Surge goes. Can you see when he picks up that leg, the stiffness and a little bit of almost a tremor in that gait? So he's picking his foot up. His mother is already crying, saying, I've never seen him take a step. Okay. And what happens is it's hard to handle somebody without touching their sacrum, scapula, or head. But I already am like, oh, my God, this guy ha kid has an absolutely gorgeous writing reactions. I'm going to put him on the edge of my leg. I'm going to put, let his, put his knees, let his knees go lower than his pelvis. And I'm going to say over, let's look, you know, I'm saying to, I'm now saying to mom, you got a good book to read, mom. Can you bring it over? And he's looking right over there. So here, this kid doesn't have head control. This kid doesn't have trunk control. This kid doesn't have weight bearing, but look where his legs are for him to get that. Look where the feet are. 
But if I showed you, if I sent you a picture of Tyler on my lap right here, and I just told you, here's my grandson, would any of you say, oh, I didn't know your grandson had dystonic cerebral palsy? No, because this is such a natural, beautiful pattern, okay? So now, when I want to take this pattern and I want to use it, I have to find something interesting that he would like to do. All right. And so the other thing is, is I'm going to work. I work on the corner of seats because I want rotation to occur. We're not looking at 99. We're looking to function. I'm lifting his butt up just a little bit with a flaxseed pillow because he already could weight bear with me. I want to see that all of us weight bear on one side more than the other. We have a preference for that. So I'm just looking to see where that is. And look what he's already doing on that left side. He's propping that arm down. But can you see the slight jerkiness of movement that's underlying his movement? So you don't see it in his head. And the reason that mouth is open is because when kids are inexperienced, they use that open mouth to help the head stay up. And, um, and so what I wanted to say is, so just look at that again, super stilled shot. So what I found out is he actually had three patterns of movement. So the first would, it would start out with the, I'm bad at right and left, but his right arm would, when something would happen, his right arm would move an internal rotation and go out which would then cause the opposite leg to flex. Then this arm would flex and this arm and this leg would go into extension. So that was the pattern. If, if there was not weight bearing occurring, then that pattern would move that the flexion would start to increase on the flex side, but this arm still stayed stuck. And when I say stuck, if you tried to grab it and move, it would become more rigid. But when I went to weight bearing, it then, stood there, seam stuck, and then just came out and came around. And what I want to tell you is, even when I'm working with really big folks, okay, let me see. Oh, um, let me instead show you M. Okay, so here's M at six is when I met her. And I just wanted to show you when, you know, she doesn't look particularly dystonic when she's doing working with a physical therapist. When the other thing is, is I wanted to talk a little bit about the head. You know, we're, we see all the tone, but when kids are resting, what we don't recognize is a lot of these kids look like they don't have head control. So they either break their headrest or then seem to have head control. And what I've been, to, I, I thought that that was a sign of real dyskinesia when they're really young, it is. So the girdles aren't talking to each other. So the head's there, but I've now found something else out the body is so it's such an amazing thing. These kids will drop their head to prevent a surge from happening. They aren't thinking, thinking that. The body encourages because what happens is, you know, the quickest way to rest is to drop your chin on your chest. Because when you drop your chin on your chest, your eyes will close and then you'll collapse. And so many of our kids that we've been fighting to get their head up, their head up, their head up, what they've been doing is they've been purposefully, not consciously, but the body has purposely said a head dropped will keep you relaxed enough that a surge won't go. So it happens though, that as I studied Emily with this and saw her really looking at the side, I suspected that she had some visual processing problems because these guys are hard to test, you know, and sure enough. And then, then you would get her here. Look at her here. And, you know, please remember, you know, and this is what she often looks like. And here she is, look at that. So everybody's like, well, see, she can do it. So why don't we have it all the time? Well, you don't have it all the time because she's not engaged in activity all the time. And like I said, with dystonia, just like anything else, they have the ability to have really important things happening. And hold on, just get my alarm off. Well, you know, they're gonna have to pull me off with a hook. You know, that five o'clock, I was supposed to give you time to ask questions and you can see I was generous. What I do want to tell you is on your handouts um, if that, that were uploaded that you can find that include two articles and the little short handout here that does just identify all the characteristics. I wish I could have shared all the kids. And I promised myself I'd start with them, but I just got too excited to talk to you. And then I, they got left because I wanted to really understand what, why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm trying to create opportunities for kids to have more experience with weight bearing. And I will tell you the one exception to feet on the floor that I do is I really love powered mobility because powered mobility with kids, I don't want them in the chair all day. I can have an opportunity to try some new seating with them. And I, cause I'm also looking for them to have control and I haven't met a kid yet that doesn't want to move. You will meet Greg who's afraid of maybe that system that you have to work on. And then I really work hard with these kids in walkers as dynamic standards, not for that, not that I don't want them to walk in them. I don't mind them walking in them,
but I want them as like in the kid walk that they could be able to sit with them and sit in classrooms. And the kid walk is the only system that was developed through anthropomorphological studies and beta testing of real kids looking that a kid, need, no kid can stand or sit for periods of time. They need to be static, but they do need to be altered in positions regularly. So I use that primarily as a stander in classrooms, but I will tell you, I don't like the seat or pommel that comes on them uh, because when the project really was developing, they made custom made that uh, center pommel for each individual kid. Uh, so I do have to alter that. But then Emily can be in that a lot of the day and not be pushing around in her chair. So please email me if you have any questions. You've been really, really nice at, for listening to me. I wish I could share more stories because the kids will really teach you. I wish you the best on your way. And really, please don't hesitate to write me if you're really challenged by a particular kid that you would like to talk to me with. The, this right now is, is taking, is my, my biggest passion has been for the last 10 years is to figure this out. And I am very far along in this journey and able to institute a lot of these things. And if you're really interested, if I could find you really interested, I wouldn't mind coming back here and even teaching half a pre-conference day or pre-conference day on this. I just always worry that enough people, it's not enough of interest, but I hope it was of interest to you. Thank you so, so much.